Welcome to Inside Medical Malpractice. This subject fascinates everyone everywhere because it affects everyone everywhere. My name is Chris Rokosh. I'm a registered nurse, legal consultant and educator, and the president of Connect Medical Legal Experts. Medical malpractice affects patients, families, nurses, doctors, midwives, healthcare institutions, the associations that define medical standards, lawyers, and the general public. Each month, we'll be looking at the malpractice issues from different perspectives, featuring honest, candid, insightful interviews by people and professionals with a wealth of information to share. Thanks for spending time with me today. Now let's dive into this fascinating subject. Hello, I'm here today once again with Paul Cahill from the law firm of Will Davison in Toronto. Paul's been a partner in that Toronto office since 2001, having started there as an articling student in 2004. His mandate is to help seriously injured people obtain fair compensation for their losses, whether it's from medical malpractice, car accidents, slip and falls, or product failures. He has successfully litigated both jury and non-jury cases in the Superior Court of Justice. He's appeared at both the Divisional and Court of Appeal. He believes that the best outcomes for his clients come from hard work and preparation. Welcome back today, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's glad to have you here again. This is the second of a series of three podcasts about a set, a three, a triplet set of medical malpractice trials that Paul ran in the past year, two of which we already know are successful, and the third awaiting judgment as of today, which is um, April 10th, 2020. Just please forgive my small pause there. We were just talking, this is the height of the coronavirus, and I think many of us have kind of lost a little bit of sense of the date and the day that it is, but we are here today. It's Friday, it's Easter long weekend. If you didn't tune into Paul's first podcast, you might not understand the significance of the number three when I say he ran three medical malpractice trials in the past year. Statistically, in our country of Canada, there's only about 60 malpractice trials a year. These are spread out between a lot of lawyers and firms that say their practice includes medical malpractice. And of those 60-some cases that go to trial, In 2018, according to the CMPA stats, only eight of them resulted in a judgment or a win for the plaintiff. So Paul's track record of running three trials is significant, in the past 12 months is significant, a huge chunk of the the trials that went on, and winning two of them is pretty amazing. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you, Chris. So, Appreciate that. Yeah. In the first podcast, you talked about a very sad case where the judgment is still under reserve. It's the Hakopian Estate v. Mahmoud. This involved yeah. a diagnosis of, diagnosis of abnormal uterine bleeding in a woman in her 50s, a delayed diagnosis of cancer, and uh, later a death from that cancer. I know it's only been a few short days since we last spoke, but um, any news or updates on the outcome of that trial? No, we're still waiting for the judgment. I'm checking my emails daily. Yeah, I bet you are. I'm sure everybody's anxious to see how that plays out. Yeah. Well, today, um, not in any particular order, but today we're going to talk about a trial, um, and the case was O'Neill-Renouf v. Ibrahim. Yes. Why don't you just take it away, tell us about the facts of the case, including the outcome for the plaintiff, and then we'll talk about the trial itself. Absolutely. So this was a trial that was tried in Toronto. Uh, I believe it was in uh, April of last year, April, May of last uh, year. No, sorry, I, I have the dates wrong. It was sometime last year. I think it was in the summertime. We all have the dates uh, wrong right now. <laughs> We've all forgotten that. Uh, so, sometime last year. Uh, and uh, what it was about, it was a surgical negligence case, and my client underwent something called a tension-free vaginal tape surgery, uh, commonly referred to as a TVT uh, surgery. And the, the indication for this particular surgery for this patient was uh, urinary incontinence. And what can happen for some women of a certain age uh, uh, and medical history is their urethra can um, drop a little, causing pressure, and uh, urinary incontinence. So the the TVT surgery, which um, is a fairly 
routine and straightforward uh, surgery. And I'll describe it in a little bit of detail because it's relevant to this case and how it was decided, um, uh, was uh, performed. And uh, basically what it does is the, the tape is inserted to kind of gently lift the urethra to alleviate um, the pressure that's causing the urinary incontinence. So this lady underwent the procedure and when she woke up, she had excruciating pain. So she woke up in the uh, recovery unit, the post anesthesia recovery unit. And the first documentation is having um, a tremendous amount of pain on, on her right side, I believe it was her right side, sort of in her thigh area. And she was unable to uh, adduct her legs. So she wasn't able to kind of, you know, when you do a jumping jack, she wasn't able to do that motion uh, with her leg on that side. Like and moving it away it was, from her body. Sorry? She couldn't sorry, move sorry. it away from her body? Is that what you're She couldn't move it away from her body, exactly. Got it. And as it turns out, there's really only one nerve that uh, enervates the muscles that allow for this range of motion, and it's the obturator nerve. So it was suspected at the very early beginning that she had suffered an obturator nerve injury as a result of the surgery. And investigations went, were underway. Uh, they did some imaging, some follow-up with neurologists, and no further surgical intervention was done and no further, you know, diagnosis was made, but that she had some kind of obturator nerve uh, entrapment or injury uh, that ultimately re resulted in her having ongoing chronic pain. So the issue in the case, and, and in this case, um, much like the Hacopian case, the damages were resolved prior to the trial. So the issue of whether you know, how much compensation this, this person should receive if there was uh, negligence proved against the doctor, uh, it was already resolved. Uh, so the only issue is whether, whether the doctor fell below the standard of care in performing the surgery, and in so falling below the standard of care, whether he caused the injury to the obturator nerve that resulted in the disability that she suffered from. Now, just backing up a bit in terms of the surgery itself. So the way that the surgery works is it, it's, a, it's a blind insertion of a trocar through uh, an incision made in, in the, uh, the vaginal wall. And the surgeon effectively runs a trocar that has a sling attached to it through that area up until the, up to the base of the abdomen and then, and then tapes it off there and then repeats the same on the other side. And uh, it basically you're threading the tape along and then you uh, fasten it into place. If you read, upon reading the operative note, uh, and this is, I think, what this case stands for, I think, for, for an interesting discussion. If you read the, the operative note, it would seem like a completely ordinary run-of-the-mill surgery. What's interesting is it's, it's a surgery that requires the same thing to be done on each side. So you do the, something on the left side, you run the trocar through the, the, the incision, and you, you tape it off at the, the appropriate spot, and then you do the same thing on the other side. And reading the operative note, everything was fine. So why did the patient wake up with excruciating pain that clearly pointed to some kind of obturator nerve injury. The obturator nerve lies quite lateral to the surgical area through which the trocar would be positioned. Uh, so lateral that the only way to cause some kind of direct injury to that nerve would be for the trocar to uh, deviate laterally in a significant way, which, because it's a blind procedure, if you're inserting the trocar or needle in a, in a way that is at a slight angle off, obviously as, as it proceeds further along its path, it's gonna deviate further and further and further. So the allegation on the part of the plaintiff was the surgeon, he must have lost his bearings, he must have deviated laterally. There is no other way that this obturator nerve could have been injured uh, had he not done so. And to deviate that far laterally in a person with normal anatomy to cause an injury that would be apparent 10 minutes after the procedure ended uh, is below the standard of care. The defense raised an argument, and this, you know, the, the context of this in the legal sense is 
you know, how do you, how does a plaintiff prove a breach of the standard of care in a surgery when reading the operative note, nothing went wrong. Like you read the operative note, everything went fine. You put trocars in, you stitched everything up and it was fine. Nothing, nothing went, went awry. So the plaintiff has to prove that the contemporary, contemporary note made by the um, operating uh, physician somehow either inaccurate or, or not complete or not reliable and infer that there was some kind of negligence not, document, doc, not documented based on the outcome. So it's a really kind of a backwards looking perspective to prove negligence, which generally is not the approach that the courts would advocate for when trying to prove a breach of the standard of care. But in surgical cases, the law does allow it where the nature of the injury requires a reasonable inference or the most likely inference that it was caused by surgical negligence. In other words, the fact that this patient had an obturator nerve injury, we can infer that the surgeon must have deviated later laterally with the placement of the trocar, which is a breach of the standard of care. Right. And so that was that was a, that was the, the the gist of the argument. And so what the defense argued was well, firstly, the operative note says that everything was done normally. So first and foremostly, um, the court has to accept that the operative note should be the most reliable piece of evidence. And hence, uh, there's no breach of the standard of care because if you read the operative note, he, he didn't say that he deviated laterally. He didn't say that there was anything that went wrong. So that's kind of the end of it. But I think the defense had to have some kind of explanation for this obturator nerve injury that was consistent with no negligence. So the defense advanced a theory that, you know, what happened was, you know, the placement of the trocar is in a way traumatic, right? It's going through tissue and muscles and, you know, as it, as it finds its way to its, its place to, to tie off the tape. And in so doing, it's going to cause some inflammation or edema. And this uh, edema can travel and it can track into different parts of the body and cause pressure. And so what must have happened is, despite having done everything right, there must have been some swelling that compressed the nerve, so much so that it caused a nerve injury. Uh, only on the one side, right? And that's the other kind of element of this case is the one of her sides was completely fine, but another, the other side of her was not fine. So there was somehow swelling on one side that really, you know, really a lot of swelling really quickly because remember she was having problems about 10 minutes after, you know, she came well, immediately after coming out of uh, anesthesia. That so there was, you know, a tremendous amount of swelling on one side that immediately compressed the nerve to the point of causing excruciating pain and uh, res restricted motion. That was her theory. And, you know, I think I was mentioning in that last podcast, <laughs> my last podcast, something about common sense, right? And, how it's easy to get caught up in some of the medical um, issues and, and terms and theories. But when you apply common sense and you have a, a, a bilateral surgery where one side is fine and the other side isn't in terms of outcome, despite the fact that the surgeon may report uh, similarity in approach on both sides, one has to wonder why is the outcome different on one side and not the other? And even as a lay person, understanding how swelling works, we know that it's not immediate. It doesn't just, you know, you know, bang your knee and then, you know, five seconds later, you have a, you know, huge, uh, massive amount of swelling. It can take hours, days even for it to reach its apex of swelling. So there was something not very palatable about that argument from a common sense point of view. But it, that was the, that was certainly the, what was uh, presented in terms of the explanation for why this happened. Before we go, that, any, that was good. Yeah. Before we go any further, I just want to back up to a couple things um, yeah. because this is a very common procedure that a lot of women in midlife either have or consider. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's not without its risks, but I guess I'd like to offer two things uh, to anybody listening here that's either had or considering having the TVT done. I mean, the, yeah. f- the first of it, you know, just this isn't a common scenario, right? I mean, you and I are talking about something <clears throat> outside of the ordinary that resulted in some significant harm. So two things to reassure anybody who's had or considering having most of the time, this is a fairly minor and safe procedure. If all had gone well, that's what happened, and she would have likely gone home that same day or not much later than the following day. But yeah. I think I think this story can also um, serve as an alert to anyone who does have this in the future or has had it and is suffering some complications that involve any pain away from you know the operative area, particularly down the right thigh when you can't abduct your leg. I mean... That's not normal. So just because there's, you know, there's a lot of women in middle age right now <laughs> with stress incontinence of one level or another. So yeah. this, this is a, you know, highly talked about and sometimes highly advertised procedures, a procedure that's done quite often. So just want to make that one yeah. point. But if we could just put a, a little bit of parameter around your client as well, you know, who we're talking about. Am I right to assume, you know, and I just assume that she's middle-aged, she has stress incontinence, she's maybe had a child or two. Um, yeah, that's, exactly. Is that the lead up to the story? Yeah, absolutely. She was, I think, I think there's no doubt that she was uh, a candidate for the procedure, a good candidate for the procedure. And I don't, there's, there's, I mean, this trial, like, like a lot of, a lot of medical practice trials that I think are advanced in the most efficient way are very much focused on the issue. And so there was no issue that, you know, she should have had the procedure. There's no issue that the physician was qualified to do the procedure. Uh, he had done many of them in his career. Um, you know, the issue was, ha- did something happen in the procedure that, that fell below the standard of care? And, and getting back to your point about this being a very safe uh, procedure and this being a very uncommon uh, complication, the fact is, you know, doing liter- literature searches, which lawyers in, in this area inevitably do, sometimes with the assistance of their consulting uh, physicians, we only found one, maybe two incidences where there was um, a recorded obturator nerve injury from a placement of a TVT tape. So, and in those cases, it was recognized that the likely mechanics of the injury was due to improper placement of the trocar. Okay, so it wasn't something that just happened um, when everything happened properly. It was iotrogenic. It was caused by the surgeon, um, which is a, which is very rare. And probably probably wouldn't be, even be something that you would uh, or a surgeon would typically warn a patient about because it's so rare. Right. That's exactly right. Because that was my next question to you. Like the consent or the the consent for this procedure, did it include anything that talked about the obturator nerve injury? Not specifically, but um, as you as you know, uh, consents are very broad. Yes, in they terms are. of what types of you know you can cause. You know, if you're if you're running down you know the consent, I mean, it can include death, right? Anytime you have of anesthesia, course. that that that's on that's on the list. That's on the list. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you could argue from uh, from a legal perspective uh, in terms of whether there was informed consent. Uh, you know. There, 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 I think was some mention of injury to nerves. Mm-hmm. Um, was there a specific mention of injury to obturator nerve? I think factually in this case, no. But I don't even think that anyone said that that was below the standard of care not to say that, right? Um, right. You, you wouldn't, I don't think you would expect a surgeon to say, yeah, there's a chance your obturator nerve could be, could be impacted. They would just say, you know, you know, vessel, you know, uh, veins, nerves, uh, yeah, arteries, sure. all those sorts of risks. I've stood at the bedside for thousands of explanations of consents to patients by surgeons. And, you know, I, I mean, I guess, the, and it does include everything, bleeding, infection, injury to mm-hmm. adjoining organisms, nerve injury, and, you know, death, everything else. And um, patients almost always sign the consent anyway, because they have, you know, they understand that those risks are relatively low, unless it's otherwise stated. And you mm-hmm. need the surgery. I mean, you're there at the point where you're in the bed or you're in the doctor's office and you've determined that that's the best path forward. I'm just mm-hmm. having a look at the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, actual judgment. And this was Justice Boltman, is that correct? Yes. And I'm really struck, you were just talking about the issue and I'm appreciating very much what you said in the way that this judgment states this. Um, 
on point six of the introduction, it just very clearly says, I love this, is two, two sentences that are just as clear as anything. There is no dispute that Miss O'Neill suffered an obturator nerve injury during the surgery. It is also not disputed that the injury to her obturator nerve is the cause of her damages. Oh, there's three sentences. But this last one says, the issue is what caused, and that's underlined, what caused yeah. the nerve injury. Very clear um, that Justice Boltman understood in the same way that you just described to me, getting to the issue. Also, point 10, you know, to, to your, um, you know, to give you a pat on the back, says, I find the plaintiff's theory to be the only reasonable explanation for the injuries. So, yeah, um, yeah. interesting. So, so I, think, I, th- I think what's interesting about this from, from a legal perspective is the the determination of causation, so the determination of how the obturator nerve was injured was going to be determinative of the standard of care issue. Right. And, and, and to kind of unpack that a bit, through the evidence, it was accepted by the defense urologist who testified under cross-examination that it would be a breach of the standard of care for a urologist or a surgeon performing a TBT surgery to cause direct injury to the obturator nerve during the surgery. So because that admission was made, and somewhat reluctantly, um, but the admission was made that, yes, if, if the obturator nerve was injured in this way, that would be a breach of the standard of care. So then it became an issue in the trial of, well, how did it become injured? Because if it was injured in that way, then the plaintiff has to win because that means there was a breach of the standard of care. And the reason why it's interesting from a legal perspective is, and and you, and you, I'm sure you can appreciate this doing all the case reviews that you do and, and looking at things, maybe more from a standard of care perspective as a nurse than causation, that often it's, standard of care first, and then we look at causation. So sure. was there a breach of the standard of care? Was there a breach of the, and then if yes, did that breach ca- cause the damage? Right. This case went backwards, um, which is somewhat counterintuitive to the way that we typically analyze these cases, but for this particular case, it was necessary. So we had to determine what was the cause of the obturator nerve injury? Was it a trauma caused by a misplacement of the trocar, or was it an inordinate amount of swelling that was unexpected, even though the trocar was properly placed, but there's so much swelling that it caused compression of the nerve. And if that theory was accepted, the defense theory, then there was no breach of the standard of care and the plaintiff uh, would not succeed in the case, even though everyone agreed that there was a nerve injury caused from the surgery. Yes, I can see that. Right? So how did you, what was your argument that convinced the judge you know, we got the two theories of the injury from the, you know, lateral movement in the trocar or the edema. Mm-hmm. How, you know, sh- tell me the words and the arguments that you use to convince a judge that your theory was correct. Just going off the top of my head, I think the three main ones were, uh, one, that this was a, a bilateral surgery. So the surgeon was supposed to do the same thing on both sides, right? Yep. And if, if, We're talking about a general amount of swelling that was caused by the placement of the trocar. You'd expect it to be the same on both sides, right? Like, why why would it be a ton of swelling on one side and no swelling on the other? So something something different must have happened on the one side than the other. Yes. So that was the first argument. Um, The second argument was this patient came out of anesthesia almost screaming in pain. Right, so she—it's not like she had a slow burn of pain that developed over 24 hours to the point that it crescendoed into this, you know, uh, problem that got investigated. But she woke up with excruciating pain, and knowing what we know about swelling, and uh, and this isn't just common sense; it's what the experts, you know, generally talk about. You would have expected something. You wouldn't have expected such an immediate response absent some kind of direct trauma. Right. Uh, and not only that, she had mobility issues. So something happened very close in time to cause this, and swelling just didn't quite seem to be the most likely explanation when you think about how the, how it develops versus some kind of direct trauma. And then the third one was 
going through the medical literature, there there were a couple of cases that were reported in the in the literature of obturator nerve injuries, and in those cases, they were caused by uh, improper placement of the trocar. Was what the authors of the studies generally attributed the uh, the me- mechanics of, of of that injury. There wasn't anything in the literature about <laughs> obturator nerves being caused by edema. Right. Uh, nothing. Well, that, and is, so, that is an area of the body that's got a lot of c- capacity to absorb a lot of edema. You know, think of pregnancies <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, and and so yeah, the they, they're all just that all area. they're saying. The pelvis, it's a big space. There's it's a, a big lot of space, space in your pelvis. Yeah. It's a big space. And There's it's not surrounded by bone. To go. Yeah, it's not surrounded by bone like brains and other places like that, right? It's a big no, no. Yeah. Exactly. And and right. and um obviously someone who knows anatomy really well would really appreciate that. A a a judge just sort of being parachuted into it may not appreciate that as much, but certainly when the physicians sure. are, are generally saying that, uh, I think that's that's important. Uh, but because there was no literature on it, th- you know, the mm-hmm. defense experts couldn't say, well, how much edema is there needed to cause, you know, compression and right. how quickly does it develop? Well, I don't know. I mean, as much as it needs, I guess they might say. Um, but I think the lack of of it being a recognized means of injury in the literature, uh, I think also helped dissuade the judge from accepting mm. the defense theory in this case. Right. And again, for anyone listening, let that also reassure you that this isn't a common outcome for a TVT procedure. <clears throat> so um, how long, anything else you want to tell us about the trial that was interesting? High point, low point, catastrophic moment? <laughs> no, no, this was a very, um, this was a very uh, straightforward trial. The opposing counsel was very reasonable. Uh, we agreed on a lot of things ahead of time. Scheduling was pretty good. Sometimes scheduling can be challenging for lawyers in medical malpractice cases because we have to get uh, physicians in from uh, from their busy practices, and and um, they can be reluctant to come. Uh, and more or less, to make it, long story short, scheduling can be very difficult, which can prolong trials and make you know people's lives difficult unnecessarily. But the scheduling all kind of worked out really well, uh, and. Uh, it was just a nice, efficient trial that uh, I think lasted about six days. So it was, it was good. Six days. That yeah, is six days. that is relatively short, isn't it? Because they can last weeks. These trials. Yeah. yeah. And how were you feeling at the end of this trial? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, did you have a sense that you'd been successful, and if so, why? You know, I I did feel like uh, I was going to be successful on behalf of my client. I had a good feeling about the case. Uh, I felt that the evidence went in well. I, I found the most challenging expert or, or the most challenging witness was probably the defense neurologist witness. I found she was, um, you know, obviously it's always difficult to cross-examine uh, physicians, but this particular physician I felt would um throw back medical jargon in my face as I try to cross examine her on certain points, mm. which I found which I found challenging to to deal with because sometimes as much as I may learn something specific in preparation for a case, if we start delving into areas that I'm not that familiar, I have sure. a hard time um, continuing a cross examination along that path. So I have to change direction. Of course. Uh, but but apart from that, no, I felt um I felt everything went kind of the way that I had hoped and expected that it would. And by the end of it, based on the judge's demeanor and questioning, I felt optimistic that she was probably going to lean towards the plane of sign. But again, you never know until you until you see the decision. Yeah, of course. And how long did that take until you got a decision? Um, so the trial, I'm just looking at the decision now. The trial was in May of 2019. And it looks like the decision was released in July, July 19th, 2019. So it was just about two months. Yeah, it was pretty fast. That was pretty fast. So describe to me that moment, Paul, for you and your client and her family when you learned that the judge had ruled in in the client's favor in this case. Tell me what that's like. I mean, it's a a great feeling. It's a little less uh, dramatic than jury cases because, uh, you know, in a jury case, you find out right then and there and your client's there and you're in the courtroom and everything. 
when you find out about a, a judge alone case, you basically get a, a fact, um, and it's attached to the PDF and, and emailed to you. Uh, so you see it, and my habit whenever I get judgments is I just scroll right to the bottom. I don't even bother <laughs> reading anything. I don't. Got it. I might read the first two paragraphs or right. three. Right. And usually from that, I know whether I won or lost. You know, just the way that the judge kind of sets up the case. The tone, um, I tell you. The tone, yeah, you yeah. know, you know, the, you know, just the way they describe the plaintiff. In a way, in like either favorable or unfavorable, you kind of know. But I don't bother with the body. I just go straight to the bottom. Right. And I see if I won or lost. And I hate, my heart's literally skipping a few beats as I, as I go down to the bottom. And it's not just about the money. It's about wanting to win, right? And, and being concerned about losing and dreading the conversation with your client that, you know, they lost the case, which is not a, a fun conversation to have at all. I'm sure. Um, so going to the bottom, finding, okay, we won. That's great. Um, and uh, yeah, then contacting the client. Usually I, I would call them on the phone right away. They'd be the first phone call I'd make and let them know the good news. And how did that phone call <laughs> go in this case? It was good. You know, I think, I think my client... Maybe I'd kind of forgotten about things because I think she wasn't even sure who I was. I, I called her up and she answered <laughs> on the cell phone. She was driving and she answered. She said, Hello. I'm like, it's Paul. And she's like, huh? Who? I'm like, Paul, your lawyer. She didn't she pause. Oh, Paul. Oh, yeah. I'm like, don't you remember? We just did a trial two months ago, Siobhan. What are you? And she's like, oh, okay. No, no, I remember now. And I was like, we won. And she's like, what? Oh. Like, we won. She's like, I can't believe it. Like, just in shock, you know? Like, um, but it, it's a great feeling. I think her husband was on speakerphone too, so it was a really, it was a really nice moment. Yeah. The thing is, in 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 litigation, there's a 30 day appeal period, and the CMPA, the Association of Defense Physicians, they often appeal. Right? It's not like there's a small chance. It's more like, well, we can kind of expect it. So as much as I like to give them the good news and say we won the trial, which is obviously great, uh, I do tell them the defense now has 30 days. So let's you know keep keep the champagne on ice right? Right. and uh, wait a bit and see if they appeal. Got and it. then after the 30 days, then we can celebrate uh, if they don't. Yeah, good. That's mm-hmm. good. So a little cautious celebration there. Mm-hmm. What, um, and I know perhaps once again, you can't talk about the amount of damages here, but what were, what was used to determine or calculate damages in this case? Or can you talk about so, that? Yeah, for sure. So this lady had ongoing pain in her thigh. Uh, which had rendered her needing a cane to ambulate. Oh boy! She was once um, at quite the an age active of, lady. At the age of what? Ish four. So she, I think, was probably uh, she was forty-four years old at the time of the surgery. Oh boy! And so at the time of the trial, she was in her early fifties. Mm. She was active, and in the judgment, you'll see that she um, played rec recreational hockey mm-hmm. she was athletic and active very uh, active in, in in her 40s and healthy and uh was now required to uh, walk with a cane to get around and had constant pain in her thigh mm, boy. and it was neurogenic pain for sure so she was taking i think it was amitriptyline which is the type of medication that's used to treat uh, nerve pain right uh, amongst other things and so yeah. She was on prescription medication to treat a chronic pain disorder um, and that had rendered her to require a cane to, to, to get around. Mm. Now, that that was obviously very significant. However, she was able to work, she was able to drive, so she was able to do a lot of things. And so the case was a lot about what we'd call general damages, which is just a compensation for your pain and your suffering. And in Canada, there is a cap on how much pain and suffering damages a person can get. It's capped at about $350,000. It's indexed for inflation, so it's constantly going up. But the most anyone could ever get for pain and suffering damages is about $350,000. And that would usually be reserved for the most catastrophically of injured persons. When people uh, say, well, in the States, I hear people get millions of dollars. Well, the reason why people can sometimes get millions of dollars is because in some states, there is no cap on general damages. And it's completely up to the jury to decide what amount of pain and suffering, monetary damages a person should receive. And in some cases, and I think appropriately, people do think it should be in the millions of dollars because they do endure such significant pain and suffering damages. 
but just imagine, you know, a 44 year old active woman uh, playing hockey is now has chronic pain and walks with a cane. Um, you know, what's that worth? Well, it's not worth $250,000. I'll tell you that as a matter of law. Um, it's worth something less than that. So there was that component to her claim. Um, there was some cost of care that was um, factored in that she may need in terms of treatment that would benefit her. And so that the cost of that was factored in um, as well. But that, that was the, how the case was assessed. Hmm. Got it. And hopefully, you know, again, for all the middle-aged women out there listening, the procedure itself was successful <laughs> to relieve the stress incontinence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. That. Yeah, no, it, it, it worked. Yeah, good. It did. Oh, good, yeah. good, good. You know, not that it makes that outcome any less devastating, and um, but certainly... So uh, it's certainly that's so unfortunate, um, and I'm sure it hits close. I mean, we talked about this in the last case. This will strike close to the heart of a lot of women and um, doctors and families and potential patients. Um, but because I'll just ask you a couple more questions, because we want to get sure. to one more trial, which I, you know, is kind of in my my wheelhouse, which I'm really interested to talk to you about. But mm -hmm. not that this hasn't been fascinating. I'm not saying that, but. Because the listeners include lawyers and healthcare people in the public, um, I ask you these same three questions about the last trial. What can be learned from this? Because I think there is no greater reason to share these stories and these outcomes from so many different perspectives, because we all have something to learn. So for yeah. doctors, let's say, based on and OBGYNs or the people who perform this particular, is there anything that came up in this trial that you got a sense of, you know, that's just some practical common sense advice that would have served this, my client better or could have changed the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what was uh, sort of an issue in this case, which I think does come up in, in operative cases is, reconciling the outcome with the operative note. Mm, interesting. How, how is it that the operative note, which seemed completely benign, produce an outcome which is almost never heard of? Yeah, so let me ask you this quickly then. Was there anything, not just in the operative note, but in the post-operative care? Okay, so there's nothing in the operative note, but was there anything in the post-operative care that led anybody sus to suspect that this physician was aware that he or she had perhaps caused an injury? Like the so, Yeah, so there, there was, I mean, I, I, I think there, there was probably, you could infer that. I don't think the judge really got into it in her decision because it wasn't necessary to mm. get into that. Right. And it was certainly consistent with, with a theory and, and the theory that I presented to the court, and again, it doesn't really show up in the, in the judgment, but that there may have been, uh, and, and you know, our, our expert suggested this as well, that there may have been an unsuccessful attempt to place the trocar, mm -hmm. which can happen where sure. a physician starts inserting the trocar, realizes that it's not quite ideally or properly aligned. So they, they pull it back and then and have a second attempt. Um, which would certainly explain how the injury could have happened, and there would also and, and yet still have a properly placed um, sling. Because if the physician actually went all the way out towards where the obturator nerve is and fastened the sling there, it would show that it wasn't properly placed. That no one disputed that it was in the proper place. So how is it that you know there could have been this lateral deviation and no evidence of it apart from the obturator nerve injury? Hmm. And so, yeah, I, I I think if you went in and had a little bit more of a closer analysis of the facts of these cases, you could maybe argue that the physician himself, the defendant, the defendant physician himself, may have been suspicious of this obturator nerve injury sure. based on the test that based on the test that he was ordering, based on the conversations he was having with consulting uh, services like the neurology service uh, after the fact, um, but. Again, it didn't. It didn't matter so much for the judgment whether there was that suspicion or not, right? Um, because of because of the way the case was decided. But yeah, I think you know what can we learn from this case? I think this particular case is a specific analysis of a 
a surgical report that can't be reconciled with a surgical outcome. And and this is not the first kind of cases that you see. I mean, in, in doing legal research for this case, there are quite a number of cases similar to this, where you had a very benign operative report and a very unexpected outcome. And um, how does that make sense is the question. And do you have a sense, an opinion, or thought on how, if the operative report had accurately reflected a course of surgery that was consistent with the outcome, mm. how would that have either changed your your approach as the plaintiff's lawyer to the case, or perhaps strengthened the defense's uh, I, I, I think it, that's a great question. I think absolutely it probably would have strengthened the defense position because I can hear my expert, Dr. Richard Casey, who I've talked with many times leading up to this case and hearing his sort of views and perspectives uh, as they formulated his opinion that he testified to. That if, if the surgeon said, I made an attempt and I didn't feel that the placement was very good, so I, I pulled back and I, I made a second attempt, and at this time it was good, he, he might not have been my expert. He might have said to me, listen, Paul, you know what? Not below the standard of care to realize that you're not quite in the right spot. In fact, that is the standard of care. Right. <laughs> to realize you're in the wrong spot and correct it. Exactly. Um, exactly. What's below the standard of care is to um, you know, make that kind of um, mistake or go la- laterally when you're not supposed to and then not tell anybody or, or document it. Right. That's not standard of care. Right, and course correct. Okay, well, that's good. So there's some um, interesting comment and advice for physicians there. What about lawyers? Because you certainly talked about the kind of backwards way standard of care versus causation that you had to litigate mm-hmm. this case. Um, advice for lawyers that might be listening in. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it. When you're looking at a surgical case, um, you know, whenever I have a potential new client who has a a bad surgical outcome, you, you know, you, you ask to see the operative node, you, you request it, and I can tell you 99% of the time it's going to read like how you'd expect the procedure to be performed if you looked at a textbook. Right. right? Like, so uh, I don't expect there to be a smoking gun, uh, sort of some recognition of some mistake or omission in the operative reports. Sometimes there is, but more often than not, it reads like how the ideal pr- procedure should be done. And actually, one of my, Dr. Casey, when he testified, and I'm sure this is in his transcript, talked about what is an operative re- report. And he, he didn't call it what happened. He called it the idealized version of what you hoped had happened, mm-hmm. is what you know surgeons often dictate, the idealized version, not the actual version. Right. Uh, so as a, as a lawyer, when you're analyzing these cases and trying to decide whether you want to um, pursue it, Sometimes the operative note itself isn't enough. Sometimes you do have to work backwards from the outcome and and have negligence inferred from the outcome, which is a scary uh, topic because we know from a legal perspective that can become contentious. Sure. Where where the the lawyers for the defense will say, "Oh, you can't infer negligence. Come on, you need direct evidence to prove negligence. Like right. that's too important to you know be something you can infer." Um, but you can, as a matter of law, you can. So you, if the outcome is really the kind of outcome that could not have happened in any other way, any other reasonable way, than through negligence. And you have experts that will say that and testify to that fact. And it makes sense. It has to always make sense. Then you probably have a good case. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. So all you lawyers out there listening up that have a question, and you know, I'm sure Paul would be happy to co-counsel on you if you have cases that you're <laughs> concerned. Or, am I right on that, Paul? Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and what about for the public? Is there a lesson from this injury, from the early days following the injury itself, or the management <clears throat> of the injury, the lawsuit? But I, I guess I'm thinking more about the injury itself. Is there a lesson here for the public? Middle aged women yeah. with urinary stress incontinence, in particular? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned it a couple of times. I mean, this is a very, very common procedure and is performed. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of these surgeries performed. Uh, some are performed by urologists, some are performed by urogynecologists. Uh, but they're they're definitely a very common procedure, very safe and effective and, and recommended uh, in certain circumstances. So this is definitely a, um, 
it's a bleep on the yeah. you know, radar, right? That doesn't really happen very often. So I wouldn't, you know, as sort of a point, even though I, I, I practice in this area and, and I guess because I do, I see a lot of medical malpractice, right? Because people are coming to me with concerns. I don't, I think we can't lose sight of the fact about how great our healthcare system is and how much it helps people. Right. And just because there is a risk of a something bad happening, not necessarily because of negligence, but just, you know, sometimes you walk into a hospital and you come out worse than when you came in. And that's yeah. not really anyone's fault. Sometimes it is because of negligence. And um, that's it's such a, I think, a rare event that it's not something to be worried about. Yeah. Thank you for reinforcing that. Because, I mean, there's nothing about this podcast that's meant to frighten anyone. I just think mm-hmm. there's lessons to be learned for all of us in telling our telling our stories. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have anything else you want to tell us about this particular trial, Paul? No, I don't think so. I think that's it. All right. Well, then let's call this um, podcast done. Thank you so much once again. Quick recap, I've been talking today with Paul Cahill um, regarding one of the malpractice trials that he read last year. Paul is a partner in the law firm of Well Davidson in Toronto. If you are a patient who has questions or concerns about your medical care or a lawyer who's looking for co-counsel on a medical malpractice case that you might need some advice on, Paul is open for phone calls and he's easy to find. Again, it's Paul Cahill from Will Davison in Toronto. So we'll wrap that up for this podcast and be back with Paul on to hear about the third trial that he ran in the last 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.